So today we are going to continue on our um, exploration of machine learning. And so let's see where we were at last time. Um, we went through an introduction of the concepts behind machine learning. So we did uh, a separation of, uh, of different types of problems in machine learning. Uh, there's classification problems where we're trying to map onto discrete targets, let's say classifying pictures of dogs and cats. Or there's regression where we're trying to predict a variable, let's say a score, um, or we're predicting an outcome from a measurement based on some input, um, input measurements. So then we had uh, separation between supervised and unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, we have a set of data that we're training our algorithm with. Uh, and in unsupervised learning, we don't have that training set. So we're just trying to get the information from the data itself. And so the, the main algorithm there that um, will be important is this clustering algorithm where we're just looking at the data itself and figuring out whether the data falls into, um, into clusters naturally. So then we've talked about training, validation, and test data sets or subsets. Um, and then we applied all of that on a, a linear regression model um, for diabetes test data. So we used a couple of different components to that. So there was a set of input features, 10 of them. Some were categorical, some were continuous. Um, all of them were rescaled to, um, to a Z value, which is basically the value minus the mean value divided by the um, the root mean square, the standard deviation. We use that to predict the diabetes score. Um, it's a, what we can think of as a continuous variable. It's not, um, it's not an integer um, classification, which we'll encounter later, but it's a continuous variable, so we're treating it as a continuous variable that's just rounded to integer values. Um, we use the quadratic loss function, so that basically replicates the least squares regression which we've already talked about um, and then we use batched stochastic gradient descent um, even though our data set was small to uh, find the the minimum in this loss function essentially find the place where our model predicts the training data best um, and then use that to uh, to look at our test data okay so um, let me first talk a little bit about these loss functions uh, so we've used in um, this linear regression model, we've used this quadratic loss function. So essentially, the mean square of the errors, so the mean value of the square of the errors that we make in our predictions, or predicted value y hat, is different from the actual value y, which we know in supervised learning because that's part of our training data set. Um, and we sum all of those squared errors. Um, so this isn't necessarily the mean of the square of the errors, it's just the sum of the square of the errors. Um, but if we just divide by the number of points, then we get the mean value. So often um, this is used, we don't need to normalize that by the number of points. That's what we call L2, um, a second order loss function. Um, we could have chosen a different function. We can use the mean of the absolute error. So now instead of squaring this absolute difference, we just use the absolute difference between y and y hat. Um, and just sum that. That's our L1. Um, we could even use a, sub, a, a custom LQ where we raise this to the power Q, where Q could be a half, Q could be three, um, Q could be one and a half, any of those values. And some of those are going to be have certain desirable properties. Uh, in particular, the, the higher we go in the power um, of our, uh, um, of our, our, our um, the power to which we raise the, um, the error, the more sensitive our, our loss function will be to outliers. So if we want something that is less sensitive to outliers, then we we'll want a small q, like mean absolute errors. If we want something that's more sensitive to outliers, then um, we'll want uh, um, a, a large q. We could also, and we talked about that briefly, um, I think, we could also add other terms to this loss function to kind of suggest things to the algorithm. For example, um, in our, our calculation of uh, linear regression, we used these parameters w, which were the weights for all the input um, features. And so if we have a vector of weights, we can calculate with the transpose of w multiplied with w, we can calculate the magnitude of that weight vector. And if we put this, if we sum the, the mean square error loss function with this um, uh, the, the magnitude of our weight vector, 
um, we will find that um, the, the training process will also try to minimize the, the length or the magnitude of this weight factor. And in, in essence, what that will do is it will prevent the W's from becoming too large. If W's artificially become too large because of overfitting, um, then adding this regularization term will prevent that. Okay, uh, so that's um, what I wanted to talk about in terms of loss functions. Um, however, now that we're going to a classification problem in log logistic regression, let's see why this breaks down. This doesn't work for a classification problem because how would we interpret the mean squared error? What if, what does it mean to talk about the square of the difference between an outcome of a cat and the outcome of a dog, um, there, there's no there's no difference, there's no um, absolute value, and there's no square that we can talk about. So instead, we have to come up with different loss functions for classification problems. And so one thing we could do is just use the error rate, um, and later on we'll call that just simply the score. Um, so that's the, the fraction of incorrectly classified predictions. So the fraction of um, times when we predicted C2 when the object was actually in C1 and the times that we predicted C1 when the object was actually of class C2 so if we have a truth table where this is the number of um, entries or the fraction of entries percentage wise maybe um, where uh, it, it was actually of class C1 and or algorithm predicted C1 and here we have the number of entries where it was actually C1 and our algorithm predicted C2, then here C1 and C2, um, and then in the bottom right corner we have the probability or the, the fraction of events which were in class C2 um, and where we predicted C2 correctly. So the diagonals here are of course where we predicted the right thing, um, the other elements, the off diagonals, are where we, where we predicted wrong. So the sum of those off diagonal elements um, are, are going to be some kind of loss function. Now, of course, we might want to weight these different diagonals uh, or the different off-diagonal elements differently. For example, let's say we're developing an algorithm where we're trying to diagnose a patient based on some health metrics. You know, we talked about diabetes already. Um, so it's more, um, it, it's not as much of a problem if we diagnose a healthy patient as being ill because the next level of tests will probably figure out that this was a false positive. But what's worse is if we don't diagnose a patient that is ill. Uh, that is a problem because then the patient walks away uh, and could potentially have serious um, uh, health effects. So we want one of those off diagonals to be weighted more strongly. Let's say it's um, the, the, the um, the fraction of events where we actually had C1, let's say a sick patient, and we predicted C2, the patient is not sick, so we misdiagnosed the patient. We want this component to be weighted more strongly, so L2 sub, uh, L sub 2, 1 um, is going to be a larger number that we multiply with this fraction than L1, 2. Okay? So the other thing we'll look at as a loss function, which I'm not, I have not listed here, is based on entropy. That is actually going to be the major um, loss function that we'll, uh, we'll cover. Um, but to be able to understand that entropy or cross-entropy loss function, um, you'll have to first understand what entropy is in the context of information theory. I'll talk about that next.